and welcome to episode 207 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. And I'm James Whittingham. This week on the show, Brian, I got published finally. Really? Was it Penthouse Forum? No, it's a book on the energy transition and how oil workers may be affected. Oh, you wrote a book. No, well, basically... I'm quoted twice for a total of about 30 words. Does that count for something? Well, but that's a pretty small book. There are no small books, Brian, just small podcast hosts. Ooh, ouch. If you order Uber Eats in Phoenix, Arizona, it may be delivered by an autonomous vehicle. Uber has removed the tip option for these robot deliveries, which is undoubtedly the inciting incident that will lead to our new robot overlords. Please, Uber, I'm begging you, let me tip our kind and generous future leaders. The CEO of the automotive group Stellantis says EVs can't be environmental until batteries weigh half as much. He's dead wrong and will outline why. However, if I weighed half as much, there'd be a lot less emissions coming out of my back end. The USA's largest public power utility has announced plans to retire what was once the nation's biggest coal power plant. At its peak, it burned 14,000 tons of coal a day, or about the same amount of coal Santa Claus delivered to naughty children who questioned the sustainability of our fossil fuel infrastructure. All that and a lot more on this edition of the Clean Energy Show. Also this week's show, that book I was quoted in reveals the horrors of what comes out of an oil refinery, particularly the one in the city where Brian and I live in Canada. And I happen to live 1.7 kilometers from that sucker and it affects me directly. So I'm going to give you some information about that book. We've uh, uh, connected with the author and I'm gonna read you a bit and discuss it. Uh, those in my city, you know, it is a population of a quarter million people, Brian may not even feel safe eating their garden vegetables after reading this book. That's how bad it is. And we have two stories on how electric vehicles aren't bad for the environment. They're actually good. We'll explain why. And uh, this will be one of the weirdest things we've talked about. A listener asked if we saw UFOs over our city after an air traffic control recording was released on YouTube. I know it doesn't really affect what we're doing, but uh, I thought <laughs> we'd have some fun with that briefly. Tesla beat Chinese automaker BYD and EV sales in the first quarter of this year, giving Brian temporary confidence that everything will be fine. It won't. Uh, you're drinking the Kool-Aid, Brian, and your tongue is bright red, I'm telling you. Also, let me get started by saying I have some corrections. Last week, I said that Larry David on uh, Kirby Enthusiasm drove an electric uh, Audi. He drives a BMW SUV, not an Audi. I think it looks like an IX because it's, a, it's a, an SUV. Uh, a yeah. popular YouTuber, Mr. Beast, who has a philanthropy that we discussed, uh, he doesn't have a 100 million. He has a quarter billion subscribers. Quarter wow. billion. That's crazy. More on coal in China. Wind and solar would make up around 40% of installed power generation capacity by the end of 2024, says Reuters. It's 41% in Saskatchewan where we are. 41% coal, and it's, That's a lot of it's coal. 40 in China, but it's going down every day because they're adding renewables, so it has a smaller part of the mix. Yeah, and we're going to talk about some coal in Tennessee as well. Even Kia is joining Ford and GM and anticipating a fall off of EV demand because the prices are too high. So they're coming out with uh, lower cost EVs and figuring out ways to make their EVs cheaper uh, because they know that that's what people want. So we'll see what that happens. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. So, you know, I love to play Jeopardy here on the show. Uh, several weeks in a row now, actually. I mean, it's, it's a thing. <laughs> it's a thing now. All right. Well, this time, instead of questions, uh, we're going to do the part of Jeopardy that everybody hates, which is the chit-chat interviews with the players. Roll the clip. Arthur Chu is a writer, originally from Cleveland. Now, you're an 11-game Jeopardy! champion. Arthur, what did you do with all those winnings? Um, I think I originally told a lot of people I might buy a Lamborghini. I yeah. ended up buying a Kia. But <laughs> it's an electric car. I'm the first person I know to own an electric car. Oh, come so on. I get to feel superior in that way and save money on gas. <laughs> Where do you live? Yeah, exactly. Tennessee? You're like from the future. <laughs> I actually bought an electric car with my winnings as well. I think I'm in good company with you. <laughs> That's... I don't know what to say about that. It's a little offensive in some ways for guys who own four electric cars between us. Yeah. Well, who knows where he lives? I'm not sure. But yeah, it's uh, a lot of people probably don't have anyone in their friend group with an EV. So, you know, that doesn't seem particularly strange. But uh, nice that Ken Jennings, uh, the host of the show, also bought an electric car with his winnings. Brian, I have a limited friend group and I have at least four people. <laughs> <laughs> 
than it's have EVs. True, yeah. And I live in a petrol state in Canada, so come on. That is a bit weird, but that come on, that is not the normal experience based on where we live, for sure. Um, and speaking of where we live, I know you want to talk about this book and the oil refinery. This is a, a, a huge, huge issue uh, for all the pollutants and everything. But it made me think of a clip from a movie that I made a long time ago. My background is as a filmmaker. And lately I've been kind of archiving all of my old films and and kind of, you know, putting them together. So I made a film in 1990 called The 24 Store. And this is not available anywhere. So don't anyone bother to go look for it. Um, but I, I'm you know, restoring it might make it available at some point. But anyway, I wanted to play a clip. This is from the beginning of the movie. And the the it's a, you know, feature comedy movie, and it's set in our city, Regina. And uh, the late, great George Dempster was an actor in the film, and he gives a bit of a monologue at the beginning of the film to kind of set the scene because, you know, movies aren't normally set where we live, Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. And so I had him deliver a little monologue to the camera to set the scene, and that's the clip I want to play. Well, let me just say before we do that, that uh, when you were making your first couple of feature films, there was no real film industry in Saskatchewan. No, yeah, it was. <laughs> there, there was your friend Barry, who's a cinematographer, doing propaganda for the government. That was kind of like <laughs> where I started uh, working on films. And uh, it was, you know, they were throwing money at it. So people were getting experience doing that. And that was great. And then a uh, film industry came after that. But, I mean, you were the first person to make a feature film in this province when, you know, you had to shoot it yep. on film. No, I'm very proud of that. The first one was Wheat Soup from 1987, a black and white feature film about an apocalyptic future uh, where there's nothing left but wheat fields, which is where we live, N not much, but wheat fields. And then 1990, this film was was uh, not really seen by a whole lot of people. Uh, but anyway, like I say, it, it sets the scene for the city with this clip. Hi, my name is Bill. This is my town. Regina is... The Queen City, home of Canada's first heavy oil upgrader. People come, people go, but mostly they just drive by. Yeah. <laughs> so the reason that's in the film is because way back then in the late 80s, they put up a sign as you entered the city, uh, welcome to Regina, home of Canada's first heavy oil I remember operator. that. What a, yeah. I didn't care for it then. I don't care for the idea now. Well, it was hilarious from the beginning. It's odd for one thing. It, it was super odd and weird. And, and right from the beginning, you would look at it and you go, why in God's name would they put up a sign? You know, it's, sure, the world runs on oil and it's, you know, arguably necessary infrastructure but you know even back then 1990 and i wasn't really probably thinking about climate change yet it seemed weird thing to be proud of it certainly was and it's like you know no one's going to drive through down the trans canada and say oh it's got a heavy oil upgrader we should stop <laughs> let's, there let's we should stop there let's 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 drive by it and uh <laughs> you know look at the exhaust pipes and uh, smokestacks <laughs> Yeah, it makes no sense. But you know what? It ties in because we are a city of a quarter million people now in our greater area. And back then, maybe 180,000, do you think? Something like that when you made the film? Yeah, about right. And it was important because the, the problem with this book that I'm about to talk about is that it is a big employer in a small city. We have a steel mill here. Uh, actually not far from my house and not far from my house in the other direction is the oil refinery. Why do I live here, Brian? I'll talk about that in a future show, <laughs> but it's, it's not a, I'm in the triangle, man. I'm in the triangle of badness. Yeah. But it, it, yeah. And it points to one of the problems that we have is that, uh, people are very, very proud of the fossil fuel infrastructure, which is something that has never, ever made sense to me. I mean, we've known from the beginning that burning gas in cars is bad. So sure, maybe it's necessary infrastructure, but to be proud of it was always weird. So uh, over the course of four years, I was interviewed by investigative journalists working on a project. And part of my interview, uh, I did two interviews with the author of this chapter of this book called Unjust Transition, The Future for Fossil Fuel Workers. You know, it was extensively done. The fact that I'm just like a tidbit in the book, giving a perspective of the citizen who deals with the refinery, you know, 
quoted a couple of times. So you're not interviewed because you're uh, on the Clean Energy Show. No, it's because I, you live by the refinery. Right. In fact, this probably predates our show, even though we started four years ago. Because, yeah, it happened over four years, and I kept waiting for this, uh, you know, what's going to come of this? I want to learn about this, what they're going to uncover. And it never really happened. But this book uh, is out, and it's got a chapter in it on the uh, environmental effects of that refinery, which is inside our city limits now. It's not a great place to put a refinery. They put billions of dollars in expanding it, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. And yeah, they didn't say, hey, maybe we should move it away from the city. They said, yeah, it's convenient there. Let's just put it there. And basically, it's a problem. <laughs> it's a big problem. Yeah. And it is among the worst refineries in Canada. I think it's got the worst environmental record. It's got the least checks on it because our government just says, hey, Jobs are important. Do what you like. And it's been and, like that since they started it 100 years ago almost. And as I like to point out, around 30 years ago, there were some emissions that came out of the, the, the refinery that peeled the paint off of cars. And for years, you would see cars driving around with the paint peeled off. They gave settlements to people to who it happened to, but some people just kept the money and left the cars just with peeling paint and drove those around for years. I don't know if that was the same as, but it's around the same time that there was a sour gas dump that poisoned a school, an elementary school, and Yeesh. made them sick. I mean, it's... Okay, here's the context of why we're talking about this on our show. It, it gets even worse. The sting of what they're doing is even worse when we know that it's unnecessary. Now, people who yeah. are new to our show may not realize the things that we realize the th because we've talked about and uh, we're constantly looking at what's going on around the world. We drive EVs. We know, we know that there's a better way, that it's not a compromise, that the EVs are actually a better experience overall uh, for lots and lots of reasons. And we don't even think about the environment necessarily when we buy one. It's not the top uh, one or two things that we think about that motivates us to buy. So Patricia Elliott was the author of this book, or this chapter rather chapter five in this book and uh she interviewed me and others uh, multiple times just for these quotes like i can't imagine the amount of research and thoroughness they put in because the the refinery is a very litigious uh place that shuts things down and that's that's one of the horrors that happens in this book the book argues that left unchecked corporations will transfer the costs and burdens of the necessary transition to a fossil fuel free future to workers because they just negotiated their contract and they said, well, we're transitioning. We got to cut your salary. We kind of, we can't cut your, have your benefits because you know, it's transitioning, uh, which is you know, a BS excuse. But in chapter five, it examines the environmental record of the refinery and the potential health effects. And I got permission from the author to read the first part of the chapter to our audience, which I'm going to do now. This is uh, chapter five of unjust transition. The chapter is called ungovernable. How a refinery became too big to fail and what it means to the people of Saskatchewan, Patricia W. Elliott, with files from Caitlin Schropp and Julia Peterson. In the archives of Saskatchewan's Court of Queen's Bench in Regina sits a brown cardboard box sealed with clear packing tape. A clue to its contents is revealed in red felt pen lettering on one side, file sealed as per order of Keene, comma J on October 13th, 2016. Cooperators vis City of Regina. From court records, we know the box contains details of a major hazards risk assessment report commissioned in 2012 by the Cooperative Refinery Complex at the request of the City of Regina. From a released executive summary, we know it contains details of smokestack plumes that drift over residential areas. We also know the city of Regina was agreeable to publicly releasing the full report in response to a journalist's Freedom of Information FOI request. And we know that the refinery's legal counsel objected strenuously enough to ensure this would never happen. As for what major risks might have been revealed, that part is sealed. For the city, its residents, and the refinery, the secret box is bound by codependencies as sticky as packing tape. If you peel back a piece, something might tear. In this light, the CRC, the refinery complex that is, the co-op refinery complex, 
uh, presents a governance challenge that municipal and provincial authorities struggle to surmount. Official records suggest the refinery has been left to largely self-monitor its pollutant emissions with limited regulatory involvement or major penalties or transgressions. Beyond cost compensation for stressing the municipal water system, that is, uh, this reflects a wider picture of Saskatchewan's oil and gas sector where direct provincial oversight of environmental impacts has been gradually reduced in favor of industry self-regulation that, in the words of the Ministry of Environment uh, presentation, invites environmental management aligned with a growing economy. The refinery has successfully propagated a general consensus that it is its operations are too crucial to the local economy to suffer any hindrance. You can't survive without me is the mantra of domination in a relationship. It is how secrets and transgressions accumulate unaddressed. What does this mean for the promise of a just transition when it comes to the health of citizens? This is a crucial question to consider. And then it quotes me. (laughs) <laughs> but you don't want to hear that. It's not necessary. I've talked about it before <laughs> on the show. Yeah, the refinery is often by far the worst emitter of bad things of any refinery in Canada. It's uh, it's a heavy read, Brian, this book, and uh, particularly when it affects you and your family's health. My family has suffered health issues that could be, you know, attributed to the refinery. If uh, I'll get into that later. Uh, I, so because it's a heavy read, I had chat G, D, GPT summarize the chapter so that it was super clear to a 12 year old. And this is what it wrote, Brian. Nice. Uh, okay. Imagine you have a group of grownups making sure companies don't harm nature too much because that's bad for our planet. But lately, these grownups have been saying, you know what? You companies can watch over yourselves. Just make sure you don't mess up what nature while you're making money. Now there's a big factory that makes a lot of important stuff, and most people around think this factory is super important because it helps everyone make money and live better. So even if the factory might hurt nature a little, people are okay with it because they believe the factory is really important for their town's money and jobs. Yeah, I'm I'm older than 12, so yeah, that, that does get down. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, people, if you don't spoon feed it to them, they don't care. They just go on with their lives. People should care about this. It affects their health. Uh, This concerns me greatly since I live and breathe near the refinery. Every night before I go to bed, I check the wind direction to see if I can open my window. Because for whatever reason, it's hot in my bedroom. I've got a router in here and it produces heat like a kettle. You know, it's just a churning out uh, heat while my daughter surfs the internet and all night. Um, it also frustrates me because I know there's a, there's a better way. That's the thing. I, it gets worse when you know that we don't even need this damn refinery anymore. It can go to hell, but money and influence get in the way of me living a long cancer free life, Brian, money and influence. So living near refineries like the, uh, co-op refinery complex poses significant health risks due to over 50 recognized harmful substances Uh, one's bad 50 is terrifying including toxic gases and heavy metals the crc with a capacity of 130,000 barrels per day was the fourth highest in toxin emissions among canadian refineries in 2019 releasing almost 20,000 tons of pollutants it also leads in fugitive emissions contributing to 48% of Canada's total fugitive emissions in 2021. That is to say, it burps and belches things it's not supposed to. It has leaks. And with all the refineries that there are in Canada, our meager refinery here, right in the city, belches out almost half of them. These are VOCs, organic, volatile organic compounds, which are linked to cancer, accounting for 36% of Canada's refinery VOC emissions from 2011 to 2021, this one refinery. In 2021, the refinery was a major emitter of hazardous VOCs, including N-hexane. That doesn't sound good. I'm not I a don't scientist. I know what that is, but it doesn't sound good. Which can cause neuro, neurological damage. It's including N-hexane, which can cause neurological damage and was half of Canada's refinery emissions at 203 tons. That's absurd okay so it has led emissions of toluene and benzene known neurotoxins and cancer causing agents you know it's it's always great when a substance causes cancer and uh neurological damage uh with 58 tons and 11 tons respectively 
This is tons of bad things. This isn't a pill jar full of bad stuff. This is tons of it. This included the highest emissions of N-hexane, ethylbenzene, naphthalene, and cyclohexane in Canada, underlying its substantial contribution to toxic air pollutants. And if none of this has your attention, consider that a 20-minute sour gas leak on February 27th, 1989, caused children at a nearby school to be overcome with nausea. That nearby school could have been the one next to my house here. I don't know. Um, records don't go back that far. If I get to talk to the author, I'll ask her if she knows. Sour gas is one of the oil industry's most feared emissions capable of causing near instant death in enclosed spaces at high concentration. So they're just damn lucky they didn't kill a whole school of kids. Long-term low-level exposure may contribute to low blood pressure, headaches, eye inflammation, and staggered gait, and neurological symptoms, including psychological disorders. Further, chronic exposure may be more serious for children because of their potential longer latency period, raising additional concerns for schools and daycares near refineries. And like I said, the reason why I quoted those books is I live at 1.6 kilometers away, like a mile away. And all too often I wake up gagging. I like, I like fresh air, but if the wind shifts or if it stops blowing altogether, the refinery plume just spills out in all directions and I'm overcome with it. And I don't know how long I've been sleeping, breathing that, but let me tell you, it kept me awake last night because I would kept wondering, you know, do I smell something? Is that it? Should I go close my window? Is it too late? Um, and meanwhile, I don't use any of their freaking products. You know, aside, if I go on an airline flight, I'll use their kerosene for jet fuel, okay? But I haven't done that. Uh, I would have, I could, I suppose, but I drive EVs. Our family is a complete EV family now. We have solar on our roof. We have uh, a well-insulated passive solar house for the heck of it, because it seemed like a good idea to use technology to save money and live beyond our means, and it's working. Um, I'd like to have the author on the podcast. I don't know if she can or not. She hasn't confirmed yet. Uh, it's possible, you know, she's scared legally to, to, to do certain things, or maybe she's just yeah. too busy, but if we can, I'm going to have a special episode of the podcast to talk about this because, uh, you know, Aaron Brockovich, this is, this is a hundred of her. This is a yeah. huge deal because the refinery cancer effects is shown to go something like 32 kilometers, which is entire, the entire city and our bedroom communities are covered by the influence of the refinery. It's not just me in the North end who gags on that. It's the stuff you can't see because they emit not only air pollution, but actual droplets, droplets that can get into your garden vegetables. And this is not a good thing for anyone in Regina. We shouldn't be just going about our business saying this is okay. But every mayor in the last 50 years who has come through this city is culpable for this. They're responsible for this. I remember Fougere a few years ago, one of our mayors, he's, when this came up about a new neighborhood going up near the refinery, and this is near me, uh, he, he said, uh, the refinery has been always good to us. That's all he said. That's the only thing he said to address this major thing. And if I could find a clip of that, I would, but I sure as hell didn't forget it. It's a major concern for me and they're not doing anything about it. The, every city councilor that has been on council in the last 50 years, when we've known how bad this is, uh, certainly in the last 30 years since that sour gas dump, you know, 35 years or whatever it is, it's 35 years now, uh, they're responsible for this. It's, uh, you know, the hell with the jobs. They can go to hell. I don't care. Let our economy go down. Is it worth dying for? It is not. I don't think anyone would say it's worth dying for jobs. I know people who have cancer. You have to ask, you know, are these people sick because of the refinery? And as sure as hell, they're not going to say, well, it's okay that with the cancer, I'm willing to sacrifice myself because, damn it, we need those jobs. Yes. Well, James for mayor um, is all I can say after that impassioned rant. So uh, thanks for continuing to, uh, to talk about this. Okay, I'm going to move on to slightly less heavy topics. And this is Waymo and Uber offering autonomous food delivery through uh, Uber Eats in Phoenix, Arizona. So this has started already, started a few days ago. And uh, if you order through Uber Eats, you'll get a prompt stating that autonomous vehicles may deliver your order. 
And you can opt out at that point if you don't want uh, an autonomous vehicle <laughs> delivering uh, your food. And it is slightly different because, of course, you have to Why would you, you do that? Outside. It's so cool. I mean, you do have to walk out to the car, I assume. That's the thing. So, yeah. uh, I mean, the, the true, you know, food delivery customer, you know, loves to just stay on their couch, I imagine. But, yeah, so what happens is it uh, drives up to your house or apartment building or wherever. You have to go out and meet it. And uh, you take your phone with you and the app, and then there's a button on the app that says, open the trunk. And so you push open the trunk on your phone. The trunk opens up. Your food is in there. You take the food. I guess you close the trunk. And uh, and off you go. So this, you know, this has already started. So people freak out in the cities in the United States. There's several of them, including San Francisco and Phoenix, that have autonomous uh, taxi uh, pilot programs going on. So they freak out when they see people getting driven around by a taxi with nobody in it. Uh, or with no one driving, but now no one's going to be at it. It's not going to be passengers. This thing <laughs> yeah. is just going to be roaming the street. Why is this thing roaming the street? Well, it's got yeah. food in the trunk, apparently. Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. A lot of people are alarmed by that, the presence of uh, autonomous vehicles. But this is, of course, uh, likely the future. The good thing is that these are all electric vehicles. Um, that's what it's like for, you know, um, autonomous taxis as well. They're all electric vehicles. So this will eventually lead to uh, cleaner air. Yeah. And uh, people probably not driving because the expense will be so much less to just subscribe to transportation as a service and uh, do that. And speaking of electric cars, Brian, I wanted to talk about something from The Guardian. Uh, a study highlighted by The Guardian reveals that fossil fuel vehicles consume vastly more raw materials than electric vehicles. So, you know, especially where we are in a lot of places, you're going to see things passed around the internet that, you know, suddenly people, farmers are caring about the environment in Wales. And yeah. uh, when it, when it, it is a cultural offense to them, but it's, it's BS. It's not true at all. People actually study this stuff. And uh, with a fossil fuel car burning the equivalent of 17,000 liters of oil compared to 30 grams of raw material loss for the EV, considering recycling. 30 kilograms, yeah. Yeah, sorry, so 30 kilograms, because people don't realize that EV batteries can and will be recycled. The reason they will be in site recycled is because there's, they cost so much that you would not throw away $1,000 into the landfill. You would get that money back and, and put that into recycling or reuse at first and then recycling ultimately. Um, discrepancy that this shows is that EVs are significantly less resource intensive, intensive over their lifetime. Because you know what? Oil that you use to burn in the car is mined. You know, it's continuously yeah. mined. 17,000 liters of it is mined and refined at the refinery down the road, which uses more energy to refine gas than the energy required to drive the same miles in the electric car because it's so much more efficient. If you're new to the show, electric cars are something in the order of 90% efficient and gas cars are something between 20 and maybe 30%, more likely in the mid twenties efficient. And that's why you have so much uh, waste heat from them. This is from analysis by transport and environment seen by the guardian. The report argued that the cost of oil extraction for, f for fuel represents a much greater environmental toll. The report pointed out to a double standard used when assessing the re relative merits of electric and fossil fuel vehicles, which takes the use of oil for granted in those reports. When it comes to raw materials, quote, there is simply no comparison, said uh, one of the report's authors. Over its lifetime, an average fossil fuel car burns the equivalent of a stack of oil barrels 25 stories high. Yikes. If you take into account the recycling of battery materials, only around 30 kilograms of metals would be lost roughly the size of a football brian because you know you th you're not throwing it away it's it's worth it whereas thousands of kilograms of oil is mined and burned for just the operation of a fossil fuel vehicle and developments in battery technology will reduce the average amount of lithium nickel and cobalt required for each car mitigating some of the increased demand for the materials as well as lowering car prices at the same time a circular economy the regulations in a circular economy for a circular economy would require higher recycling rates and cut demand even further. We anticipate a, a circular economy in the future. Yeah, so there is slightly more resources that have to go into building an electric car, but 
um, yeah, you you, you got to remember that 17,000, was that barrels or liters? Uh, uh, um, 17,000 liters of oil have to be continually mined and processed to put into that car over its lifetime. So, yeah, there's absolutely... Uh, no comparison. That is a little ridiculous. So, Brian, Ramsey sent us a YouTube video in our mailbag this week. It's from a channel that I actually regularly watch because it's about uh, aviation air traffic control recordings whenever somebody has a problem or lands in a field. I yeah. want to hear about it. I want to hear the the drama in their voice as an actor and as an aviation nerd. I want to hear what real life drama is like. And of course, it's mostly pilots that watch this stuff, but apparently one of our listeners did. And uh, they actually mentioned our city, our humble city of Regina, with our heavy home of the heavy oil upgrader in Canada, <laughs> because a plane was flying over our city, one of the passenger jets. And between here and Winnipeg, they saw three lights in the sky, uh, <laughs> with three unidentified flying objects. I had one of the report. Uh, 10 minutes ago from a, a Morningstar flight uh, east of Regina uh, reported the same thing. Uh, her best guess was, was around somewhere around flight level 500 and uh, thought it might be somewhere north of, of Winnipeg. Um, so yeah, we're, so or do, do you have a guess as to what you might think the altitude is? It's hard to tell uh, just because the evening I, I'd say she's probably pretty accurate but they keep forming up in a triangle so then yeah, it's pretty odd it's pretty hot. So a lot of pilots actually were on this forum saying, I've seen things that I haven't seen before, mm -hmm. but do you know what I think it is? And they say it's not, uh, Starlink, the Starlink satellites. Yeah. Wouldn't that be fairly obvious? People are starting to know what those look like. I know, but here's the thing. And some, some other people have pointed this out. It was just before dawn. So when you're at a place just before dawn, the light shines from the sun can hit the upper atmosphere. And when we go to sleep at night, when the sun goes down, it's down for us, but it's bright in the upper, you know, sure. outer space. And it, that's why the space station shows as the brightest object in the sky. And you can see it whizzing overhead at a relatively fast speed and it looks big and bright. Well, this is the same thing, but in the morning at the pre-dawn, it's probably lighting up satellites at different altitudes. I choose to believe they're either balloons, more Chinese balloons maybe, but they, they're not, they're not aliens. I, I just don't see it. I know a lot of people like to believe this stuff, but that's, you know, not part of what I do until they come down and probe me. I'm not going to uh, assume anything. Uh, while it's still dark, like you see it space, this stuff flies by and you can see it. The event actually took place in January of this year, but some have commented that they've seen the exact same thing before. But there are airline pilots in the comments saying things like this. I'm extremely happy to see that so many of us here in the comments are corroborating this. People keep saying satellites, but I've seen all manner of satellites, rocket, junk, debris, space stations flying around in space. This is not behavior that we have, uh, have the capability of replicating in space. Then at least one person offer, offered a uh, more sedate explanation. My guess is that they were seeing a suite of low Earth orbit satellites, such as Starlink, that would randomly catch the correct sun angle to light up with a reflection. The motion of them was not real because of the result of different ones lighting up the correct moments in sequence. If we are invaded by aliens, I apologize to our alien overlords, but I don't think that's what it is. But it's fun. I thought I would mention it because we made it onto my one of my favorite YouTube channels. Yeah, I'm a skeptic. Yeah. And, of course, that uh, effect of the sun over the horizon, that's what gives us our spectacular sunsets, is that, you know, the sun is down, but it's still uh, projecting light into the sky, lighting up uh, the clouds and giving us fabulous sunsets. It's the same kind of effect. Uh, okay, on to a story now from Power Magazine. And uh, this is about coal power in Tennessee. The Tennessee Valley Authority is apparently the largest public utility uh, in the U.S., and they're going to retire their 1.3 gigawatt Kingston fossil plant in Tennessee in 2027 and replace it with notable urgency with a 1.5 gigawatt modern complex featuring a combined cycle gas turbine plant, uh, aeroderivative turbines, 100 megawatts of battery storage, and up to 4 megawatts of solar. So I wanted to talk about this because part of the reason that they're retiring it, and they 
do have a plan in place to get rid of all of their coal by 2035, which is fairly decent time frame for a place that has traditionally relied on a lot of coal. Obviously, sooner would be better. But uh, the idea here being that um, it is difficult for things like old coal power plants, things from the old style of our infrastructure, of our grid, to keep up. Like once you start adding things like, um, it, this is uh, primarily driven by the additions of nuclear, gas, and renewable resources, it really changed the mixture of the grid. And of course, coal plants are not great at cycling up and cycling down really quickly. It's good for kind of base load power. But, you know, we, for instance, when you do add a bunch of solar, then obviously you have a big peak at noon. And you may have to cut back on your other types of generation, but it's difficult for a big old coal plant to do that. And things like gas are much more easily, like quickly kind of booted up with a, you know, like a gas peaker plant. Now, of course, we here at the Clean Energy Show would prefer that they just put in solar, wind, and batteries. Um, but there is a bit of an urgency here, and I think that that's maybe why they're not doing this, is this all has to be done fairly quickly because they figured out that 2027, it would just not be viable, this plant, this old power plant may not be viable in 2027, again, because of the, the changing mix and uh, how things are going to kind of uh, basically work differently um, since then. So... Uh, yeah, three to four megawatts of solar, 100 megawatt battery. And uh, yeah, this is all happening by 2027. And it's already dropped a lot. So TVA, they operate only four coal power plants now. This is a big reduction from just 10 years ago uh, when they had about 11. So they're from 11 down to four coal power plants left. And, uh, you know, by 2035, uh, they're planning to get rid of all of them. Um, and, you know, even further back in time, they had way, way more coal than that. So in Canada, where we have regulations to shut down coal by 2030, the United States, they're getting shut down for economic reasons. They're not, not competing. Sometimes it's cheaper to build, say, a solar farm than it is to just keep that coal complex running. I'm, I'm surprised by the, um, the ratio of battery storage. I know that it seems like battery storage are getting huge, like 100 megawatts is pretty big, but it's only four megawatts of solar. Usually those are closer in ratio when you talk about battery and solar going up somewhere. Yeah. And of course, we always like to criticize when, uh, you know, anybody is putting in gas instead of solar or wind. But, it, you know, it, it, it I, we do have to acknowledge this is not an easy transition. It. It can be done. We can absolutely switch to a clean grid, but it will take years and you do have to be careful about what you're putting on the grid and when you're taking stuff off the grid because, you know, we all need uh, a, a reliable power source and, you know, it is, it's not like it's easy, but it absolutely can be done. Um, there's some fun statistics here. So when it was finished in 1955, this was the largest coal-burning power plant in the world and it held that distinction for about a decade. And yeah, 14,000 tons of coal a day at its peak, or 10 terawatt hours a year. But 14,000 tons of coal a day was being burned in That's this thing at its worse peak. worse than the refinery here, for God's sake, uh, yeah. almost. And it's, it's not burning as much now, but, you know, it's still going to be a lot. So there's another... Um, historic legacy about this plant. There was a devastating coal ash disaster in 2008, which released 1.1 billion gallons of coal fly ash slurry, a disaster stemming from a broken dipe, dike, and it was said to have left four or five feet of water and mud over 250 to 400 acres of rural land. So, all of this fossil fuel infrastructure, not just refineries, all of it has these kinds of uh, possible environmental consequences. And this incident prompted the Obama administration to develop new rules about uh, coal combustion ash, which is obviously some kind of a byproduct, um, the fair, you know, terrible toxic byproduct of burning coal for our power. Yeah, and we don't need to. Uh, coal plants already have a a good tie to the grid, the power grid. So it's, you yes. know, when you retire them, you might as well use that tie to the grid because that's part of the, you know, the problem with coming up with renewables is tying it to the grid. So if you already have that grid connection, that's a good place to do it. You know, Brian, um, I think since our last show last week, 
the Alberta grid had another alert saying demand, you know, reduce your demand. It's not freezing cold. It's not boiling hot. It's, it's perfectly in between. Yeah. And yet they screwed up again and they blamed it. Guess on what? Guess it was wind and solar. We didn't anticipate the wind and solar properly. Well, Texas, for example, has a, you know, it's dominated by wind and solar now. They somehow predicted the weather patterns properly there. They even know when the eclipse is coming. You could have followed the eclipse. Did you? <laughs> the eclipse killed my solar on my roof and I lost money. The stupid moon. Uh, I should sue it. But that's what happened. And, you know, it's, it's stupid. Do you know what was down? Do you know what was unreliable? Gas plants. Three of them. Yeah. Offline. Tripped offline. It's, you know, we haven't even really begun to do the clean energy transition. So this is still basically a fossil fuel grid that they're complaining about uh, going down. It's time for the tweet of the week. This is from Colin Walker at Walker 79. Walker is the head of transport at the Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit, which is a nonprofit initiative that supports informed debate on climate and energy issues. He posted a long thread on X in response to the CEO of Stellantis, that's the parent company of Jeep and other automotive brands, uh, where he claimed the battery weight of EVs would need to be halved for EVs to make electrification, quote unquote, environmentally meaningful. Now, Walker in this tweet says this is incorrect. He points out a lot of facts, which I'm going to go over as quick as I can here. First up, where I agree, yes, obviously, the more we can lighten our cars, the better. And this applies to all cars, not just EVs. Petrol cars have been ballooning in weight for years now. The lighter the car, the less resources to build it and the less energy to move it. And the good news is EV batteries are getting lighter. Batteries are getting about two times lighter per energy unit per decade. We call that, um, you know, the volume of their uh, the energy density. So the volume and weight of the same amount of power in those batteries are getting, you know, lighter and lighter. You're getting more power in the same volume and weight, so which is great. Uh, by the time that most cars being sold are EVs, that is to say the mid-2030s when most cars that are sold in the world are EVs, they'll be as light as the petrol cars they are replacing. Where I strongly disagree with Mr. Tever's comments is the implication that EVs are being built today won't have a meaningful positive environmental impact. And here's why. First up, raw materials. Uh, Stellantis says that EVs require an extra 500 kilograms of materials to build than a typical petrol car. He says, from an environmental standpoint, I don't think it makes sense. But there are a few things that he doesn't say. Petrol cars are typically burned 12 tons of natural resources extracted from the ground. Oil, maybe you've heard of it, over the course of their yep. lifetime. You have to mine 12 tons of that stuff for your car. Uh, didn't mention that, which obviously it's, it's used and then it's gone. If you mine materials for a battery, it'll still be in use 160 years from now. 130 years from they have done studies on this. Like, I don't know what life will be like then, but theoretically you could keep recycling it for 100 years plus. Uh, meanwhile, EVs use electricity that's increasingly generated from renewable resources. You're EV gets cleaner every day, no matter how much coal you have on your grid, it's still better to drive an EV and it gets cleaner every day because even here, more and more renewables get put on the grid. Furthermore, all those minerals in an EV's battery aren't used once and gone forever. They can be recycled. In fact, at the end of an EV's life, only 30 kilograms of material will be lost. The rest can be recycled and reused. This is the circular economy that we mentioned earlier. And we hope to use much less stuff as we move net to net zero. We currently extract 15 billion tons of fossil fuels every year. If that wasn't bad enough, they refine it next to our cities and make us sick and die. As we move to net zero, our critical mineral needs will be actually, Brian, 500 times lower. It's incredible. So despite their greater weight, the fact that most of their mass can be reused in the future means that today's EVs will result in us mining and using less stuff, not more. And he says, as far as I'm concerned, that's pretty environmentally meaningful. Yeah, and the actual amount of energy needed should drop because, as you mentioned earlier, EVs are way more efficient with the energy that they have. You know, some something like 80% efficient with their energy you know, whereas only 20 or 30% with gasoline cars where, you know, 
the other 70% is just wasted as heat. It's really, uh, it's really counterproductive so that future looks bright. We should need actually less energy uh, overall, especially for things like uh, transportation. Uh, okay, from Electrek BYD. So it was a bit of a rough quarter for electric car sales. It sounds like mostly in China, uh, sales were down. And so uh, Tesla has uh, regained the top spot in China. They didn't have a great quarter in Q1. Q1 is always a weak quarter, uh, quarter for cars, but it was basically weaker than everyone expected. So it sounds like uh, China is kind of the main culprit here. And China that has, has a, a very weak Q1, and people say don't even listen to it because uh, there's two weeks of uh, Chinese New Year, and I think it's the place shuts down yeah. you know, for two weeks and then maybe a little bit beyond that on the shoulders of that as well. So. It's it's slow here as well though, but not in China is particularly slow. Different issues, but the you know sales were down for both. Uh, but yeah, Tesla back in the lead in Q1. I don't particularly care who's in the lead, but uh, there you go. Yeah, I mean it. It just goes to show that, that you know if somebody else, the third party, came and overtook, that'd be great too because we want EVs to be sold. We want the world to become cleaner. It's time for the lightning round. The lightning round is a fast-paced look at the latest headlines in climate, clean energy, and transportation. Electric reported on the Brazos Wind Farm in Texas, initially completed in December 2003. It originally powered 30,000 homes. So 2003, after 20 years, Brian, they shut down wind farms. They decommissioned them because that's about the life. Uh, you know, a solar farm can last 30 years. Yeah, they don't last forever. So, yeah, they came to the point of uh, replacing them. Uh, so, yeah, originally did 30,000 homes, and now it does 60,000 homes because of new technology. So, yeah. yeah, this just goes to show that when you replace stuff, I mean, when they replace the solar panels that are installed today, they'll probably be <laughs> maybe twice as good 20 years, 30 years from now. Who knows? But that's that's what that is. is. It's the same land, new turbines producing a lot more electricity. Solar topped coal in Texas for the first time ever in March. That is to say the power grid had more solar power on it than coal. Uh, Veneta Energy plans to construct a 90 gigawatt hour seasonal thermal storage facility in the underground caverns near Helsinki. So. You know, a, um, a nuclear reactor puts out about a gigawatt of power, right? So this is 90 of those for one hour. That's how much energy it's going to store. 90 nuclear reactors for one hour or one nuclear reactor for 90 hours. Uh, that's a lot of energy and it's going to do this uh, in the largest seasonal energy storage project by all standards, uh, when it is completed in 2028, the stored heat will be used to heat buildings and a district heating system during the winter. Basically, excess wind and solar will be used to create heat, and heat will be stored underground in heated water. And they're going to pressurize that water so that the water can get up to 140 degrees Celsius without, bo without boiling. So if you put it under pressure, it doesn't boil. So there's enough heat that they can literally collect it in the summer and store it until the winter. That's amazing. It is. And then they'll go right into those buildings. According to analysis by Reuters, the number of electric cars in Norway could overtake petrol cars by the end of this year or early next year at the latest. The historic overtake is approaching. Now, we always we say that it's over 90% of new car sales in Norway are yeah. electric. Most mm -hmm. of them are EVs. A few of them are plug-in hybrids, which have a plug on them and you use electricity most of the time, supposedly. Well, they've banned the sale of new cars starting, I think, at the end of this year or the beginning of next. Yeah, the beginning of next. And uh, But yeah, half the cars on the road will be electric. More than half. It'll be the majority. It will be electric, which is fantastic. And it's a good it's a good window into the future for us to look at as well. What you know the problems and hiccups, and there haven't been many of them. It, it's amazing that over ninety percent of new car sales in Norway are electric. But of course, you have an existing fleet, and you know all over the world, it's going to take a very long time to replace this existing fleet. But it will eventually happen. And yeah, Norway is always our uh, window into the future. Uh, uh, you know, a uh, half electric by uh, late this year or next. That's amazing. And that's, of course, and thanks in part to generous incentives from the Oslo government fueled by wealth from the sale of oil and gas abroad. They didn't, they didn't, you know, they didn't throw away their, their, uh, their revenues from oil and gas. Time for a CS fast fact. Australia 
gets 12% of his electricity from rooftop solar from the latest figures. So <laughs> this is solar in houses. This isn't huge sprawling wind farms that goes yeah. on for as long as the eye can see. This is because so many people, there's different reasons for this, but a lot of people with solar, it's 30% overall, I think, as in Southern Australia, it's 50% of its homes have solar panels on them. There are places that have 70% regions of Australia. At the end of last year, rooftop solar was at times meeting all of South Australia's power demand. Just from rooftops. Just and from rooftops. So. And our government here, our provincial government says in 2050, when the yeah. world is net zero, we maybe have 8% solar overall. Because well, that's really all that's possible. You know, this may be one of the reasons they're trying to discourage people from putting up solar is because it could force them to retire the beloved coal plant sooner, as we talked about in Tennessee, that once the mix in the grid starts to change, you know, those coal plants become less viable sooner. So there there could be a method to their madness of, of trying to keep solar out uh, because they love their coal so much. Greta Thunberg was detained twice by Dutch police as a demonstration at a demonstration in the Netherlands, along with other protesters. She tried to block a major highway to The Hague. Uh, she told journalists that she was protesting because the world is facing an existential, existential crisis. It is, Brian. She is yes. correct. Uh, headline on Bloomberg, $200 to fill up on California's hydrogen highway. Fuel cell cars are losing the battle to battery electric vehicles because that is a lot of money to fill up. I can fill up for seven bucks in the driveway, nine bucks. Uh, if you have the equivalent distance that a uh, fuel cell could go, maybe it was 13, 14, 15 bucks. A lot better yeah, than 200. So this is 200 to fill up a hydrogen vehicle. But of course, there's very large SUVs and trucks that uh, with gasoline probably cost that much or almost that much to fill up. So it's a lot more and you can't have a hydrogen fuel station at home. They've talked about it, but it's very complex. And why would you want that? Uh, EVs take up 28% of market share in France. That's 28% of new car sales in France are now at almost one in three. Uh, of all the vehicles sold, uh, you know, one in three. So 23% in March in the United Kingdom. So 23% United Kingdom, 28% in France what seven or eight percent here something like yeah, that we're, we're lagging behind here in north america but hopefully catching up soon tesla has unveiled plans for a the world's largest supercharger station with an impressive 200 stalls in yeehaw junction florida that's right yeehaw junction that's why i'm covering this yeah! is that a real place it's a real place i was on the fence about mentioning this story that i saw that it was at yeah! junction <laughs> Tesla has reduced the number of days it takes to prefabricate a supercharger at the factory. These are the superchargers that you have on the highway that have a huge grid connection and charge your car really fast when you're going on a road trip or if you live in an apartment and you need to go to the supercharger station. Well, they need to just put these out. So they build them in a factory. It used to take, I think, eight days and now it takes four days. So it's drastically slashing the time which is great they put yeah, them on this... concrete slabs and then lift those onto trucks and they're ready to go they just lay them in uh the pre-wired places at the site and it works a lot a lot more yeah, efficient it's... a lot faster it's the installation at the site that tends to take the most amount of time. And so, yeah, they got it down to eight days for installation at a site with these prefabricated units. There are several superchargers on a concrete slab, and now they've got it down to as low as four days. And of course, deploying all this stuff quickly is really, really important as uh, we transition. From Electric, China's IM Motors has officially opened pre-orders for its L6 sedan. Why is that important? The automaker confirmed earlier today or yesterday that the L6 will be powered by semi-solid-state batteries. Not full solid-state batteries, but semi-solid-state batteries. And guess what? A thousand kilometers of range or 620 miles, which is more than you probably should have unless you have a special purpose vehicle but yeah, yeah. so solid state battery is one of the holy grails of battery development this is semi solid state so we're not quite there yet but of course mass production is often the hold up for these things but this seems like a great start solid state has the potential for uh, even better range and you know ford mustang mach e that's um one of the most popular uh, electric cars in north america and you can find one on a lot today uh yeah, they're getting uh, an update. So extra 30 kilometers of range, 20 miles extra range, 20% faster charging, but that's still 
takes it from 10% charge to 80% charge, which is the typical use scenario on the highway. And at a supercharger, it's going to take 36 minutes, which is twice as long as the Hyundai Kias that have an 800 volt architecture in their cars and uh, can do it in 18 under perfect circumstances. And finally this week, this is from the Energy Mix, a new study out of Stanford University that tested combinations of hydropower, batteries, and green hydrogen as storage options for global grid stability pinpoints conventional hydropower as the lowest cost pathway for energy storage in Canada. As you've pointed out, we've got a tremendous amount of hydropower in Canada, not where you and I are, but generally in Canada, on the, in Quebec and uh, BC, tons of it. Yeah, we already have a very clean grid in Canada. Overall, it's something like 86% uh, low emissions. So, um, yeah, we can apparently just use this hydro uh, kind of like a battery. So Canada needs neither batteries nor hydrogen, the report says, or fuel cells from hydrogen for grid electricity storage because the country's immense hydropower output and abundant wind resources as well, says the study author Mark Jacobson, a Stanford engineering professor. Uh, hydropower is basically a big battery, he says, on its own. It can be used for either base low power or to provide grid backup. You just turn, you just stop the water and let it flow harder, you know, uh, when you need it during rush hour, when people get home from work or whatever. Uh, the study covered 145 countries and found that 45 of them, including Canada, could rely on hydro for storage during the transition. Supplying all energy needs with wind, hydropower, and solar voltaics would reduce the country's total energy demand by 61.5%. 22.7% of that production would come by eliminating the energy needed to mine, refine, and transport fossil fuels and uranium. That's one-fifth of our power goes to places like that refinery that is killing us, and we don't need to do that. We need to get past that. The resulting energy for all purposes in Canada will be met primarily by onshore and offshore and wind, solar, PV, and utility-scale plants on rooftops and existing hydropower. He said the hydro would be the main electricity backup source, while batteries and green hydrogen would be helpful but are not necessary kind of a different take on the energy transition brian yes fantastic the current infrastructure is pretty inefficient and we can do better with clean energy all right that's our show for this week please take the time to contact us clean energy show at gmail.com and around social media clean energy pod and voicemails online at speakpipe.com slash clean energy show you can find videos of our show on TikTok and YouTube, including special content not featured on the podcast, The Clean Energy Store, as a link in your show notes if you'd like to buy a t-shirt or a hat, rate and review us on Apple or uh, wherever you get your podcast, wherever you're listening to us, if you rate us and review us, it helps us a lot. So we ask you to take the time to do that and you can donate with PayPal to help us keep podcasting. The link is there in your show notes. If you're new to the show, welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, we have fun doing this. This is a huge deal to us. The energy transition is exciting and there's a lot of news and that's why we do this every week. So subscribe on your podcast app to get new episodes delivered. And we might have some special episodes coming up on your feed. So don't be surprised if you see a special interview or two coming up in the next week or two. We'll be working on some other stuff extra that we don't normally do, but look forward to doing this all again next week, Brian. Yeah, see you next week. 